Okay, hello YouTube. Today we're going to be going over the Rey Lopez, and more specifically we're going to be going over the Rey Lopez exchange variation. So after e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop to b5, we have the Rey Lopez, and as you can see here, black can play basically anything he wants against the Rey Lopez. Uh, he can play a Berlin, he can play a Schliemann, he can play a Steinitz, he can play a Classical, he can play a Bird, or he can play the Morphe defense beginning with a6. So if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, please hit that subscribe button and click on that notification icon. So I'm not going to cover everything in just this one video. It's just absolutely impossible. I'm actually going to have a hard time even just covering the exchange variation uh, in such a short video. Uh, so we're just going to be focusing on the exchange variation. We're not going to be focusing on the rest of this. Uh, I am going to do more videos on the Ray Lopez. This is probably part one of like 88 uh, for my Ray Lopez videos. Uh, only a slight exaggeration. Um, so anyways, so we're going to begin with the Morphe defense beginning with a6. And of course here we have bishop a4 and bishop c6 are both possibilities. But today we're only looking at the exchange variation beginning with bishop takes c6. So here black has two options, but only one of them is a real option. So the real main line here is just to play d capture c6 and capture a away from the center. And this is not only to speed up development, it's also to make the position favorable for Black's two bishops. Black wants an open position for his two bishops because this is the only counterbalance he has to White's better pawn structure. If Black takes towards the center, Black actually just has a major disadvantage, and it's not necessarily for the reason you might think. You might initially look at the position and be thinking to yourself, well, of course Black has the disadvantage. White can capture the pawn on e5. But even in this position, knight tax for e5 is not very good. If we play knight capture c5, black can equalize with either queen to e7 or queen to g5. And probably the most straightforward is just queen g5, knight f3, queen g2. And we have an absolute mess of a position on white's king side. White's never going to be able to castle over there. And basically the fact that black has two bishops and white's pawn structure is messy and so is black's means that the position should be approximately equal. So knight takes e5 is not the correct remedy in this situation. The best remedy for this b capture c6 is just to develop. Just play something like knight to c3, queen f6, d4, e takes d4, knight takes d4. This position should just be major advantage white, just because black's pawn structure is incredibly awkward. It is not clear how black finishes his development and how black activates his bishop pair. So the fact that white has a much cleaner pawn structure and has this four on three majority on the king side and has two very pretty pawn islands, whereas black has one, two, three pawn islands, this should all just favor white. So this should just be major advantage white. So b6, c6 is not recommended. Really, you need to play dc6 with black. So here white basically has a slightly better pawn structure and black has a bishop pair to compensate. So what should white play from here? So if you're playing the white pieces there's basically three options. You can play the Lasker variation beginning with pawn to d4. You can play the Carries variation which is an attempt at an improved Lasker variation beginning with the move knight to c3 or you can play the move that Fisher introduced uh, or reintroduced into practice uh, which is another attempt at kind of an improved Lasker variation uh, beginning with the move castles kingside. So I think it's important to understand the Lasker variation if you play the exchange variation because this was kind of the idea that started it all. Lasker wanted to play this move pawn to d4, and his idea was pretty straightforward. After e takes d4, he wanted to just exchange queens and get to this position where he had a 4 on 3. And he just felt like, okay, a 4 on 3 is an advantage. I have 4 pawns versus your 3 pawns. I have a potential pass pawn at some point in the endgame. Now, of course, to counter this advantage, black has the bishop pair. And this should actually more than compensate for the fact that white has a 4 on 3. But in Lasker's time, people didn't really take advantage of this. They didn't really respect their bishop pair the way they were supposed to. As a matter of fact, in one of Lasker's early games where he played pawn to d4, his opponent immediately played bishop g4, proving that he has no respect for his two bishops. And then after, uh, and then Lasker continued d takes e4, queen d4, king d1, uh, bishop to c5, king e2. And now we have castle's queenside, bishop e3, just basically saying, hey, do you want to trade off your bishop pair? So his opponent understood that he couldn't do this, so his opponent played bishop e7, tried to keep his two bishops. And then we have h3, again, offering the exchange of the two bishops. Now here it's, it's, it's such an awkward moment for black, because you can either exchange off the bishop pair, uh, or you can retreat the bishop. But if you retreat the bishop, of course, you're still down this pawn on the e5 square. And white has this huge predominance of pawns in the middle of the board. So this is Lasker versus Pollock played in Baltimore back in 1892. Um, and Lasker went on to win. And it was just a very ugly kind of to look at game for the rest of the game. It continued bishop h5, uh, knight d2, f6 to just try to break up the center pawns. Uh, rook d1 takes g5 and then takes on e5. There was just no defending it. Knight f6, f3. He holds everything together and then he just kind of simplifies into this endgame where black still has the two bishops. But at this point, black is just down a pawn. 
uh, so there's really nothing to write home about. And then black had to give up his bishop pair anyway, because the knights just got too powerful. So now it's just black is down a pawn. And uh, he also has inferior pawn structure. So effectively, white is up two pawns on the king side. So we have this rook h2, and then we have a few more exchanges. Uh, black did manage to get one of his pawns back, so he's not down a pawn anymore. But white has a very clear pawn majority, so white ended up winning this pawn, and now he's just going to you know, push his remaining passed pawn much, much faster than black can push his, and the game is essentially over. So after uh, queen b4, uh, of course, uh, this is going to end in mate. They played it all the way out, though. King c6 and then queen d6, I guess. This was the fanciest way to win, the point being that they can't play c takes d6 because rook c8 picks up the queen on c1, but really at any point, black can just resign here. The position is already ridiculous. Uh, so this is Lasker versus Pollock played in Baltimore back in uh, 1892. So Lasker was very fortunate that nobody really played incredibly well against the Lasker variation back then. Probably best is just to take on d4, and then after queen takes d4, queen takes d4, knight takes d4, except this four on three, and then just try to activate your two bishops. And this is exactly what happened in Peterson versus Alakine played in 1935. So Alakine playing the black pieces continued with bishop to d7, and then we had uh, this move bishop to e3, castle's queen side, knight t2, Knight e7, uh, castle's queen side, rook e8, rook h e1, knight g6, knight back to e2, bishop to d6, h3, and this was Alakine's whole idea, is to focus his two bishops on d7 and d6, focus energy on the e5 square, focus energy on the f4 square, making it difficult for white to activate his majority with f4 and e5, and then eventually to just try to open the position with his bishops, which he does with his next move. He plays pawn to f5, takes, and then he plays knight h4. And here, Alakine didn't even care so much if white tried to defend everything. So, like, if for, ex if for example, um, you know, white continued with pawn to g4 and tried to defend everything, Alakine could have just played knight g2, rook h1, knight takes e3, f takes e3, rook takes e3, won a pawn, and still had a very open position for his two bishops, and he would have been very pleased with that. Uh, so he wasn't even terribly concerned uh, that that white was going to try to defend everything with something like g4. But as it turned out, white didn't, and it, it got even worse. Uh, white continued with uh, like knight to c4. We had knight takes g2, rook, rook over, knight takes e3, takes, takes, bishop to e5, and now it's the bishop pair versus no bishop pair, and both pawn structures are equally messy. And of course, after a few more moves, this just ended incredibly badly when Alakine activated his two bishops and then just tied down every single one of white's pieces to the point where they couldn't move anymore and white just kind of resigned. Uh, so this was Peterson versus Alakine played in 1935. So that's this this stem game is one of the main reasons that I don't like playing just the straight up Laska variation with d4, because when black does activate those two bishops, it's a very difficult position to play with white. So you have basically two options to play an improved version of the Lasker. Uh, you can play this move knight to c3, or you can play this move castle's king side. Now, of course, they both have their downsides. Uh, if you play against castle's king side, you do have to be very well prepared um, if they play this wild line with bishop g4, h3, h5, kind of known as the fishing pole trap. And you have to be very well prepared against this because black is prepared to sacrifice material and get a mating attack. And if you don't know your theory absolutely correctly, uh, it's very easy to get checkmated in these positions. So the slightly simpler way to play this is to play the carries variation beginning with knight to c3. And then the move bishop to g4 is just unsound because, again, it's showing disrespect to the bishop pair. Here we can just play h3. There is no fishing pole because we're not captured, so if they play h5, we just take it. Uh, so here, uh, bishop takes f3, queen f3 is just advantage white. Uh, black no longer has a bishop pair. White has the better pawn structure. So advantage white in this position all day long and just very clear advantage white. Uh, and if they retreat, again, we're just losing material. Uh, we just take this free pawn on e5. So bishop g4 is kind of a no-go against knight c3, so they have to spend a tempo playing this move pawn to f6, and then we can play the Lasker variation beginning with d4. So the carries variation is an attempt at playing a Lasker where both sides have thrown in an extra move. White's thrown in knight to c3, black is thrown in this move pawn to f6. This favors white a little bit, because it gives white one extra move, which makes a big difference uh, in terms of having the bishop pair and having black's activity, push your pieces back and out of the middle. So one example of this is after e takes d4 and then say queen takes d4, queen takes d4, knight takes d4. Uh, we have this game Harry Christian versus Ding Liren uh, that was played in uh, 2017 that continued c5, knight on d to e2, bishop e6, knight f4, bishop f7, knight d5, castles, bishop f4, rook d7. And you can see that basically the key difference between this position and the Alakine game 
is that white's knights are very, very active. And this actually makes it very uncomfortable for black to keep his bishop pair. But black has to, because if black doesn't keep his bishop pair, he's just going to be worse. So if at any point he plays something like bishop d5, ed5, or bishop d5, knight d5, then clearly uh, white has the advantage. So he has to continue to try to undermine white's position without losing his bishop pair. So that game continued castle's queenside, knight e7, takes, takes, rook takes, takes, rook d1, king up, knight d5, bishop d8. And we see these two dominant pieces on d5 and f4, and black still has his bishop pair, but neither side really had quite enough to win. Like, white doesn't really have enough to win here, even though he's got the four on three, and he's got very well-placed pieces. And black, even though he's got the bishop pair, he doesn't have a great way to dislodge white's pieces without losing his bishop pair. So it turns out this position is just... Uh, basically equal uh, but it's a no risk way that you can play the position with the white pieces and you can try to take advantage of your four on three so i think knight c3 in this respect is a very reasonable option especially repertoire wise uh, for a lot of players with white especially if you're in a situation where maybe you need to get a draw in the last round and all you need is a draw and if you can get something a little bit more than that that's fine but you just don't want to take any risk i think knight c3 is very reasonable for those situations i was actually in that situation once where i had to draw an international master in the last round of a tournament and uh, I decided to play this with white and I did manage to get the draw even though my opponent uh, uh, posed a lot of problems to me <laughs> with the black pieces made it very difficult that bishop pair is actually quite scary um, but I did manage to get the draw it's very difficult for anybody to get anything out of this position white or black um, so then we have this last option which is maybe the most recommended option out of the bunch is this castle's kingside option reintroduced in the tournament practice uh, by bobby fisher back in the 1960s so again the idea always comes back to this last variation we're trying to get this four on three we're trying to get a more favorable version of this four on three so once again we do have to be prepared for this bishop to g4 and we have to be prepared for the wild complications of the fishing pole so you kind of have two options to meet this after d3 queen f6 you can play the main line so to speak which is knight on b to d2 and then you have to worry about this whole sacrificial continuation which is very complex uh it continues knight e7 and then we have rookie one and then we have knight g6 uh then we have pawn to d4 is considered the main line uh knight f1 is another possibility but d4 is considered the main line to try to get uh a uh, slight edge with with white we have knight to f4 we have hg hg and you have to know this line kind of exactly if you don't know the theory exactly you will get mated here it's very easy to get mated uh, in this position you have to play g3 give back the knight on f3 you have to take back with the queen and actually the game that we're following here uh if you want to go ahead and look it up and do your own computer analysis on it we're following masija versus adams played in uh, greece back in 2003 so that game continued knight e6 takes on e5 they have the option to play queen e5 for queen h6 queen h6 is definitely the scarier uh then we have knight to b3 we have g5 we have bishop e3 and then we have queen to h3 it's how that game continued queen to g2 queen to h5 pawn to f3 and at this point uh white had basically pushed back the attack uh but the game still just ended in a draw so this was Masija versus adams played in uh Rethium, uh greece back in 2003. so for me uh these lines are all kind of scary and dangerous looking and you have to know the theory uh very very well so kind of going all the way back here um i mean even the move uh even the move knight f1 is kind of a scary move here this isn't you, you have to know all of these sacrificial lines very, very carefully. Uh, so knight f1, they could even just play bishop takes f3, and this position should be at least uh, this position should be at least equality for for black, if not a little bit better. So like knight f1, bishop takes f3, queen f3, queen f3, g f3, and then bishop to d6 is actually very similar to the line that I'm going to give here, which is if we play instead of knight on b to d2, we could play this move uh, bishop to e3. Now here, if they don't play bishop takes f3, we follow up with knight on b to d2, and most of black's really scary threats are no longer playable. So after bishop e3 and then knight on b to d2, the position is clearly slight edge white if black allows it. So the only way that black can still kind of get equality is play bishop takes f3, queen f3, queen f3, g f3. Now at this point, if black allows pawn to f4, Again, white's going to have a predominance of pawns in the middle of the board, and white will clearly be better now that black's bishop pair is gone. So black has to immediately play bishop d6, then we have something like rook d1, knight e7, knight d2, and now knight g6 should make it difficult to play pawn to f4. But at this point, that's going to be the battle. White's going to try to get, at some point get in pawn to f4, and he's going to try to get a predominance of pawns in the middle of the board, and black is going to try to keep that at bay. So this particular game, uh, uh, so so this 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 line follows actually a couple of different games, 
uh, but the position for the most part should be considered um, relatively relatively equal. So going back, um, what are some other options other than this bishop g4, h3, h5 fishing pole line? Well, back in Fisher's day, people tried all kinds of different stuff. But one of the main things that they tried was kind of one of the big main lines here is just this move pawn to f6 and then d4. So here, Fisher had a couple of really good games in this line uh, with the white pieces, uh, beginning with this move bishop to g4. I think the move that I run into the most here is just e takes d4 and then knight takes d4, c5. And now here, either knight to b3 or knight to e2 are pretty close to equality. Fisher's recommendation was just knight to b3, and then after queen takes d1, uh, rook takes d1, uh, Fisher gave like slight edge for just about every single black move, except for one um, that he didn't mention. Um, and that move, bishop e6, should be pretty close to equality. But against other moves, it seems like white's actually doing pretty good here. Uh, it's actually very difficult for black to fully equalize in this position, uh, just because white has a, a, a pawn that he's attacking, white has weaknesses to attack, and white has a little bit extra development. And again, that really matters when you're trying to make this four on three work in these positions. Uh, so that line is good. Another attempt was uh, knight e2 that was actually played between Nakamura and Anon, played back in 2018. That game continued queen d1, rook d1, bishop d7, knight on b to c3, castles queenside, bishop e3, rook e1. And then after Nakamura activated absolutely everything and made a couple little threats, it, it just, there wasn't enough in the position to really do anything. So the four on three and Anon's active pieces, the position was just kind of equal. So that's just kind of the problem that everybody seems to run into, is these positions are just kind of equal. So unless you can catch your opponent kind of doing something that they're not supposed to do. And uh, Fisher got lucky a few times. Uh, he had some guys play bishop g4 against him, and of course he would continue uh, with pawn to c3. And uh, he had a couple of really interesting games in this position. So one of his games continued with e takes d4, c takes d4, uh, queen to d7. Um, and then we have this move pawn to h3. Uh, we have bishop to e6, we have knight to c3, castles queenside, uh, bishop to f4, and you can see Fisher's position is just kind of classically beautiful. Uh, it's a very nice structure for all of white's pieces. This is ideal. Like, we have two center pawns, and in no way does a bishop pair compensate for two center pawns. Uh, this is just a much more favorable uh, set of circumstances for the exchange variation. Uh, then we had this knight e7, uh, rook c1, knight g6, bishop back to g3, bishop d6 now, just trying to get rid it's the position's already starting to get desperate uh and at this point fisher wasn't even interested on in getting rid of the bishop pair at this point with something like bishop d6 he he, he just started activating his knight he played knight to a4 and this is actually a much more scary move uh, than just exchanging. So here we have his opponent uh, exchange. We have this bishop to g3, and then we have this immediate uh, f takes g3. And the whole point is this knight is coming into the position. We're going to be playing knight c5 as a huge threat. So uh, we have this move king to b8, knight to c5, queen to d6, and then we have queen a4 just bringing the pieces over to the king side. And you'll see kind of where this all leads in a second. After king a7, we have the sacrifice. Uh, knight takes a6. Uh, just desperation, bishop takes h3. There, there really is no defense. Like if bishop takes, we have rook c6, it's just winning. So just kind of desperation. We have this bishop takes h3, e5, uh, knight takes e5, takes, takes, knight c5, check, and then takes on h3. And then at some point, um, Fisher's opponent, who was Gligorik, realized he was two pieces down. <laughs> and then he resigned. <laughs> so we, we can't all get that lucky, though. I mean, Fisher was winning games very quickly in the exchange variation. This was basically a miniature. Um, it was a 25-move you know, game. Uh, and the main reason is Fisher was getting this predominance of pawns uh, in the middle of the board uh, because, again, his opponents just forgot uh, about respecting their bishop pair and not playing this early pawn, bishop to g4. It was allowing them to play this move pawn to c3 and get this predominance of pawns in the middle. And uh, it was basically, uh, you know, if you show disrespect to your bishop pair with a move like bishop g4, you don't have a great position. If you just play uh, this move e takes d4, uh, this position is probably just uh, somewhere around complete equality. But that doesn't mean that you can't play this position uh, for a win uh, with the white pieces. You can still try to play for a win from here and uh, just kind of try to play the four on three and just try to play for a win, uh, even though the position is, is really, really uh, equal. So anyways, uh, that's how to play the exchange variation with the white pieces. Um, I hope you found this video helpful. Uh, I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you can play some of these ideas in your own games. Uh, thank you very much for watching.